And now all of the 3D elements are in the right place, but what we're still missing is a bit of post-processing magic to turn the current state of the app here on the right to the original version on the left. And that's going to be the focus of this last part of the series, and it all starts with the Effect Composer component. Now, this simple but really powerful component from the post-processing library lets us specify a whole array of post-processing effects that can be included as children of the component. We also have to enable the stencil buffer because at the time that I'm recording this video, it is disabled by default. And in the third part of this series, we started using stencil buffers for the portal effect. And to show you how simple it is to leverage this component, I started adding some effects like depth of field, U saturation, brightness contrast, and chromatic operation. You can think of the last three as the same filters that you will use in Photoshop to adjust the colors of a picture, and depth of field instead is going to be used for the camera defocus effect that blurs objects that are far away from the part of the scene that is in focus. You can choose how big the blur radius is, where is the plane of focus, and what's the distance before the blur effect starts. And that alone is enough to make a difference. Now the floating rocks are being properly blurred because they're out of focus and far away from the scene. Uh, we also have slightly shifted the tone of some of the colors and there is a small, albeit it's hard to see uh, on a video, but if you look closely here on this piece of grass, there's a small uh, RGB shift effect thanks to the chromatic aberration component. And I've now included a small spotlight to the scene. It's inside the flow component because we want its position to remain relative to the central floating island. And you can play with the parameters that I've set here, uh, but as a small refresher for the most important properties, position is obviously the 3D point in space where the spotlight is being positioned, and target position is instead going to be used to determine what's the direction of the spotlight. Basically, if you pick one of these two points and you subtract the other one, you're going to get a direction that is going to be used by the spotlight to determine where to shine its light. The angle variable controls the size of the cone of the spotlight, and angle power regulates the strength of the fade effect at the edges. A spotlight will shine light on the objects of the scene, but it's not going to create a visible mesh that looks like a light emitter. And that's the reason why here, I'm creating a mesh that will look like the object that is shining light on the scene. I'm making it in plain 3JS code because I'll have to reference this object in two different places later on in the video, but for now, I'm just going to include it here in the float component as a primitive object. And there we have it, this is the little object that will look like our light emitter, and at the ground level, you'll notice that now there are some reflections caused by the spotlight. That looks okay so far, but we're missing one last step that will make all the difference, and that is adding god rays. God rays have been used a lot in games to give a cheap approximation to volumetric lighting. Now, the effect normally needs a point in space, often referred to as the sun, because the most common application is to simulate sun rays with it. There's a bunch of import statements here that VS Code is not automatically picking up for me. For you to find them out, uh, make sure to import them from post-processing. Going back to our god rays components, we're going to use the mesh that was created as a light emitter at the top of the portal, and this object will be used to generate our god rays. Keep in mind that the effect becomes much more visible depending on how many pixels on screen this mesh will cover. Now I'll go over some of the properties that you can specify in the components. Blend function, you can think of it as like the layer type in Photoshop. So in this case it's screen and uh, the colors will be added on top of what was previously specified in the uh, frame buffer. The number of samples that you choose to compute god rays will affect the final quality of the effect. I'm using 40, which is a pretty high value and that's obviously going to affect performance a bit, you might want to experiment with lower values and check if they work for your project. As a true professional, I have absolutely no idea what these ones are for, but for exposure, at least for this one, I know that increasing or decreasing it will strengthen the intensity of the light emitted by the god rays. This type of effect will need to compute its values inside a separate buffer, which is going to be essentially a texture, and these parameters, actually with an 8, are going to control how big this texture is, and if it's too small, it's going to affect the end result. Um, in this case, I'm using, I'm, I'm letting the, um, the post-processing pipeline choose its own size, and I can do that by using the out-of-size property from the resizer construct. 
God rays normally leave um, on artifact, so if you don't blur them, you would see uh, jagged edges, unless you're using a crazy high number of samples that would affect performance too much. So normally what you would do is blur the end result to alleviate that artifact, and you can choose to opt out of this uh, step by setting blur defaults, even though I personally don't recommend it because the best look that I've got was by keeping the blur effect enabled. And here is it in action. Uh, it's a small addition, but a powerful one. I especially like the way that it looks when the mesh gets in between the branches of the trees. It's almost as if the effect completely disappears and then it gets back in full strength whenever the mesh is visible again. And I think that it's a very simple effect to set up, but the result is pretty remarkable and it really sets the mood of the scene. And before we wrap things up, I wanted to briefly go over one last component, and that's scene particles, which is comprised of a bunch of sparkles components. And sparkles is a dre utility that spawns small particles around an area. But there's not that much to say about it. You can choose the position in space where you want to spawn your particles, how many you want to spawn, uh, how big the area of effect is, the colors of the particles, the size of each individual particle, the speed of the animation, and how wide the movement will be. And I'm placing a bunch of particles all over the scene. I think the two of, the, of these are close to the trees. One is in front of the portal and another one is on the foreground. Now we just have to import them inside scene container. And in no time, we have particles and the video is over. Uh, this was the original scene that we wanted to recreate at the beginning of the series. And I hope you had fun following along. Hopefully you've learned something new. I sure have. This was the first time for me uh, building something in Blender and then using it for one of my tutorials. And I hope that I can repeat the same experiment again for future videos. And until then, I hope to see you soon. Bye bye.